pleased to have with us today in front of the camera is Dr. Enid Neidl, uh, educator, research administrator, uh, recipient of loads of awards. Um, Enid, welcome to the International College of Dennis. Thank you, Dick. I'm very flattered, very uh, honored to have been chosen for this interview, and I thank you. One of the things that I, I think most everybody would be interested in, and I'd like to sort of begin the interview with that, is um, is really your unusual position in, in dentistry, not being a dentist and having been president of the American Association of Dental Schools, um, lots of senior positions both within education and also at the American Dental Association. Um, maybe you can give us some background as to how, how all of this happened. I, I don't honestly know how, how I came to where I am today. Uh, maybe I should tell you how I got into dental education and that's that's where it all starts. Uh, I had um, my first postdoctoral job as the first woman professor of physiology or anything at Jefferson Medical College, now Jefferson University. Uh, and I was there for a while and I loved it and I felt very pleased to be the first woman and incidentally this was before women were even accepted at that medical school as students. And then I got married, or I had been married, and uh, in, that t in those times, uh, women did not say to their husbands who were commuting from New York to Philadelphia, you continue to commute or give up your job. So I gave up my job, and I moved back to New York. I then had a job at the City University, and City University had a fantastically art archaic tradition of requiring women who became pregnant to take a year off. And I did it the first time with the first child. When the second child arrived, I said, this is stupid. I'm not going to waste a year of my life. So I looked around for another job, quit the city university, and entered New York University's College of Dentistry. And over the years, I went from the Department of Physiology to the Department of uh, which was then merged with pharmacology. And when they split the two departments apart, I became the chairman of pharmacology. And I think that marks the beginning of a kind of minor ascent mm. into leadership positions in dental education, uh, election to the university senate, um, activities in the AADS, uh, a, a greater level of visibility in dental educational circles. Well, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit and, and, and cover, the, cover that ground just a, a, in a little bit more detail. Um, your PhD was in? Physiology from Columbia. And, and that was at, at PNS. Now, it, it, was there a difference in terms of getting a PhD at the Physician and Surgeons, which is where the medical school is located, versus the Arts and Sciences at, at Columbia? Yes, because there was no program in physiology or biochemistry at the university uh, hmm. at 116th Street. Uh, the more medically oriented basic sciences were located in the medical school and basically you took your medical, your, your courses with the medical students. So you had a very medical orientation to the work that you did. And, and during that time, um, had you thought about going into medicine as opposed to the, the PhD in physiology? I had thought about uh, medical school, but I abandoned that thought about the time I graduated from college. They were reasons I think they probably had to do with gender more than anything mm. else and what I thought would make a good career for a woman. Uh, very few women were going into medicine at that time. Many schools didn't even take women. Mm. Uh, so I thought PhD made more sense. I might add that my father, who uh, was a scientist and had his PhD from uh, Columbia but in the physical sciences, um, was uh, very encouraging of this and thought it was an appropriate uh, way to go. The, the PhD in physiology. Right. Um, tell me about some of the things that led up to the decision to um, go for the PhD in physiology. You went to Vassar. Vassar and I was a science major in Vassar, a chemistry major, again reflecting my, my father's interests. 
uh, with a very, very strong background in English. And mm. I could very well have qualified as an English major and have always seen as myself as an English, uh, pers English major person in Mon uh, But uh, there I was in science. I was urged by my professors of English to take a year off and think about what I wanted to do. Mm. I was too stubborn to, to do that. <laughs> uh, so I immediately entered the graduate program at uh, Columbia as a graduate student in biochemistry because it was a natural extension of my interest in or my training in chemistry. And within a very few months, I realized that this was too abstract for me. It was not right. And so I went to the physiology department, which was more biologically oriented and asked whether I could transfer, and they accepted me. Let's, let's go all the way back now, and I, I'm kind of eager to hear a little bit about um, the, the sort of the, you, the early years. Um, did, did you grow up in New York City? Yes. And um, let's see, your dad, you said, is a scientist at university? He started in the universities uh, at a time when people were paid, you know, two thousand mm. dollars a year or three thousand, mm. and eventually decided to uh, create his own business, which was uh, a mm. scientifically oriented business. But he never abandoned his interest in theoretical science, and he was a crackerjack mathematician as well. And your mom? Uh, my mother had an unusual uh, history. She was. Um, um, a married woman with children, uh, married relatively young, and uh, before my father died, I arranged for her to go into a um, college completion program, which she did instantly upon his death. Within two years, she was finished with that. She went on to get a PhD. Isn't that interesting? In what? In American studies. Huh. And, and what did she do with that? Well, she tried valiantly to find permanent teaching positions. She was successful in finding temporary ones. Hmm. And eventually realized that there was no market for um, PA, women, women with PhDs who were in the mid-50s. And so she contented herself with becoming an editor of a very successful series of books on immigration, immigration trends in the United States. And each of the immigrant um, groups that she studied, and she wrote three of these books herself, uh, was authored by uh, a man from this area, the Greeks, the Chinese, the Koreans, oh. et cetera. Must have been about 30 or 40 books that she put out over the years until she died. And the day she died, she was working on the editing of one of these manuscripts. Oh, my. And when you take a look at that, that early background, the, the decision then was to go to, to Vassar. And, and I'm just wondering what prompted that. Um, oh, that well, was simple, because it was the best women's college at that time. I think people are surprised to hear that. but. I mean, I think today Radcliffe would be regarded as a, the prime women's, or it's not women's any longer, uh, but if you wanted to go to a very serious school, Vassar was the place. And it had at that time reputation for turning out more uh, PhDs and more working women than any other women's college. Hmm. And had you ever thought of going to a, a co-ed school? Yes, my backup school was Cornell. Mm -hmm. And what, what prompted, what was going on in your mind and when you were looking at those choices? Oh, I wanted to go to Vassar. Mm -hmm. Co-education, remember this, this goes back a long time, Dick, so uh, we didn't think in terms of co-education quite to the extent that we do now. And I want to add that I think it was the greatest um, educational experience of my life. And I deeply regretted the decision that Vassar made um, in the s late 60s to become co-educational. I fought it, but I realized their survival depended on it because mm -hmm. Vassar uniquely is geographically very isolated and, and the only men mm -hmm. uh, available to women at, at uh, Vassar were, were those at West Point, which wasn't 
a marvelous choice for everybody. Yeah, and it, it seems now that there's been a, a whole movement now to going back to um, single-sex schools, well, particularly all women's schools is, is what I'm reading now. Yes. And um, at least some of the reasoning, and I'm just wondering if it fits with your experience, was the, the, the fact that, it, that having just an all-women's school would do a better job in terms of preparing women for leadership positions. I don't know whether that is the simple explanation okay. for it. I think what happens is that if you put women in an all-women's college, you eliminate some of the distractions, the social distractions that mm. inevitably arise in a co-educational institution. And you also say to women, you are worthy, and we're going to develop you to your full potential, whether it's high leadership positions or positions in scholarly professions or writing or whatever. But you do release the woman to be the intellectual star that she can be. I mean, not everybody who went to Vassu was brilliant, but there were a lot of very brilliant women mm -hmm. and very successful ones. Let's, let's move along now. And, and um, the, the, when you left Vassar, you made the decision to get the PhD and went to Columbia for that. Um, tell me about that point in which you needed to make some decisions about doing something with the PhD, what the, the career choices that you were making at that time. Uh, again, uh, we're talking about a time, I think, where you didn't stop and think for a long period, what am I going to do now? You, or at least maybe that reflects the way I operated in my life. Uh, you, the, you followed a natural progression. I went directly from college into graduate school. I went f directly from graduate school into a job. I was offered three or four jobs when I left uh, uh, Columbia. Uh, by, I graduated in June. Uh, in September, I was in place in a job. Several were teaching jobs, several were pure research jobs. The Jefferson job was so attractive and so honorific that I couldn't turn it down. And I think I knew by that time that I wanted to teach. And tell me about uh, the, that lasted for about a year, and then after that, then you, you moved to um, NYU Dental School. No, I, oh. I had um, at least uh, four years at uh, City University. Oh, I see. And, and a little time at Long Island University. When City University said to me, you're pregnant and you have to leave for a year, I, I, I quit. Mm -hmm. uh, I quit at the end of the semester or the, uh, the year. And I got a job at Long Island University and um, then immediately began looking around. And a f former graduate student with me at NYU, at uh, Columbia, who has had an enormously successful professional life, uh, said, I am leaving New York University College of Dentistry to do something else. And I will recommend you for that job if you're interested. And I said, sure, I'll take it. Oh. And that, and that began the career in dentistry? That began. What was, what was your sense when you came into dental school? I and mean, here you had been through, you know, first at Columbia, being trained with physicians at, um, at Jefferson, which was, uh, again, a medical school. Do, do you recall what that was like? I think I felt very different. And I think I felt some antagonism on the part of the clinical faculty, whose attitude was not just to me, but to other people who did what I did, that you don't understand. We are the clinicians. We're out on the line. We know how to make things work. You're teaching these students a lot of stuff they will never use. Hmm. and. I'm not sure that in my very long teaching career that ever totally ceased. I, I want to ask you about that. Um, it was as I sort of went through your CV and, uh, and and some of the some of your publications. There was something that struck me, and it was really about this basic science issue. And I'm going to see if I can 
put my finger on it. It was really a presentation that you gave to the with the American Association of Dental Schools, and it was um, it was called the Paradigm of Failure. If I can, if I can if I can put my finger on on it exactly. Oh, here it is. It was actually it was published in the journal Dental Education. It was called the Paradigm of Failure, the AEDS Conference on the Basic Sciences. And I wonder if you might want to just expand a little bit on on well, what that failure was. Well, let me just say that that was a conference that was part that was of my presidential year uh, at the American Association of Dental Schools. And so I decided to use that year to do a few things that I considered important. And I uh, wanted to explore uh, using, um, with the help of some outstanding dental educators, what they thought the level of success was in training dentists in science. Mm -hmm. And I called it the paradigm of failure because from my point of view, I didn't think we were doing a very good job. And I think largely the other panelists, um, and I can't even remember all of their names, but I know, remember Jim Kennedy was one, and um, uh, the current, uh, Dominic DiPaolo was another. Uh, all of us pretty much agreed that we were not, while well, we were trying very hard to do this job of, of injecting science into the practice of dentistry, that we really weren't there yet. And, and what's your sense in terms of why that happens and how does one make it different? You mean why we were failing? Mm -hmm. I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, one is that there continues to be, has continued to be, resistance on the part of the clinical faculty, which is, while increasingly young, still retains a lot of people of considerable age, a lot of part-time teachers who have stayed on the faculty for a very long time and have not had the experience in science that the younger people have had. Um, the second is that the curriculum in the dental school is rigidly divided between basic and clinical science. And what happens in most schools is the student tools along in the basic sciences comes up to a wall, goes through a door, mm -hmm. slams the door behind him or her, and goes on to clinical sciences or clinical practice, and everything that he's had before is forgotten. And it is forgotten with the assistance of his or her clinical teachers who say, forget about that stuff, mm -hmm. because it really isn't important. What you really have to learn to do is fix teeth. Now that's getting a little better, but it's not perfect now. Um, the third reason, which is even more subtle, I think, is the kind of student, the kind of person who comes into dentistry. And I think, because that's a self-selection process, I think many of the young people who choose dentistry choose it for its technical aspects, for its entrepreneurial aspects for its the opportunities it provides the practicing dentist to interact in a helpful merciful way with patients but they don't see themselves as scientists so what difference would it make I mean, I mean someone might point to uh, dentistry in the United States and says and would say we're certainly a success. I mean, this is probably the outstanding oral health care in the world. Um, how, how would dentistry be different, or how would you propose it be different? Well, I think that's a marvelously provocative answer, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not precisely uh, prepared for it, but I'll give you one, one thing that I think might be important. The proportion of elderly people in the United States is growing by leaps and bounds. And we now talk about the extremely elderly or the fragile elder, elderly. And they are seeking dental care. And they represent real medical risks to anybody mm. who provides treatment to them. 
Yet I don't know many dentists, and I have tried to choose dentists very carefully for my own uh, use, uh, who are asking sensitive questions, educated questions, of these elderly people about their medical status because the medications that the dentists use, the local anesthetic that he chooses, the posture which the patient assumes in the chair and when he gets up from the chair, uh, the interactions between the medications that the patient is taking and what the uh, dentist might prescribe to alleviate anxiety prior to an operative procedure, all of these things have a potential impact on the patient. These are very simple but they, in order for them to happen, the dentist has to see himself as a, a medically, scientifically oriented provider of health care. Um, the area that you evolved into, pharmacology, um, is, is sort of an interesting area. You mentioned just now the, the, the drug interactions and the need to know the person's medical condition. What was your experience at NYU in, in teaching pharmacology and the receptiveness of the, the students and what they came away with? Uh, I have to be vain in answering that question. I think that my course in pharmacology was considered the most uh, user-friendly, the most interesting basic science course they had because suddenly they saw themselves operating in the practical world of mm -hmm. medicine and dentistry and they were more delighted with that than they were with the transmission of electrical impulses in the heart. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind my interrupting with no. something because you asked a wonderful question about how the scientific orientation might helpfully affect the way dentistry is practiced. One of the biggest failures in dentistry, practically speaking, that I know is the inability of most dentists, most general dentists, to cope with a patient who's on cancer chemotherapy, who are having agonizing troubles with their mouths. And these dentists don't know what to do. They don't understand the drugs. They don't recognize the names. All they know is this is a patient who is on chemotherapy. I can't handle it. And they dismiss them or they fool around uh, and I think that's tragic and I also think it's got to be solved because what is it going to be 50 percent or more of, of everybody is going to be on chemotherapy at some time. Hmm. That seems like a large number. There's I'm not sure hmm. that it is hmm. I, I in their lifetime. So. I wanted to comment about that pharmacology, and this is from um, an article that you wrote with um, Tony Picozzi. This was written in 1983, and it sort of re reflects the, the comment that you just made. Um, the, the final paragraph says, thus we, predict that if, 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 thus we predict that if ever it has been important for the dentist to be informed about pharmacology, it is now and in the years to come. This is a challenge not only to dental schools, but to the dental profession and to the drug manufacturers. I'm sort of curious, though, about the, the way you ended the sentence, which was that it was important to also the drug manufacturers. And, and what were you oh. trying to say there? Well, I'm not sure what I was <laughs> trying to say in 1983. Uh, I well, think what would you say now? <laughs> I'll say now. <laughs> I think that the drug manufacturers have simply ignored, as, as have many sectors of society, by the way, the fact that dentists are prescribers of drugs and users of mm. drugs. And they have been very resistant to providing educational materials. Uh, I got into a tremendous fight with Merck Sharp and Dome uh, while I was at the ADA because Merck Sharp and Dome refused to provide vaccine in sufficient quantities to dentists so that they might vaccinate their entire staff against hepatitis B. And I was incensed at that. Their claim was they were not uh, trained to give injections. Hmm. And I found that totally laughable. They do the most delicate injections, the most skilled injections of any physician I can think of. 
and I did get almost up to the president of the company in protesting this. Uh, I think that the drug companies are simply unaware that dentists use anti-anxiety drugs. They use local anesthetics. They use antibiotics in great quantities. Um, uh, I, I could give you a whole long list. That's not the point. Uh, and yet they, they won't provide them with a PDR. They'll send it free every year to every physician in the United States, but a dentist has to go out and buy it. That's what, I think that's what I meant. <laughs> um, let's, let's come back to um, the, the basic sciences again. And um, you've been at, at NYU and then after your stay at, um, at the ADA, now at, at Columbia. Now I know Columbia has been making a major effort to pull medicine and dentistry closer together. And I'm, I'm just wondering from your experience sort of being able to kind of sit outside of dentistry somewhat, at, at least in terms of your degree, what your sense about that is and will it work and should it work? Uh, it's a very, this is a difficult question to ask because I do work at Columbia now and I, I don't want to um, diminish in, any, mm. in anything that I say the sincerity of their efforts. Basically, it seems to me nothing has changed at Columbia. Remember, I was Columbia trained, and I was teaching as, a, as an mm. assistant dental students when I was getting my degree. And at that time, the dental students and the medical students took their basic sciences together just as they do today. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure when they talk about making a medically oriented dentist out of the dental student, what exactly they mean. They have a limited master's degree program in the basic sciences, which has been accepted by perhaps six of 70 students or in, in a class. Um, they talk a lot about it, but I'm not sure that anything very different has happened. Uh, to the extent that a Columbia student does basic sciences with the medical school, it must be concluded that they're getting a very, very high level of basic science instruction, much of it beyond their, their understanding. They have a hard time. Let's move from like what is to what ought to be. Um, and given your experience now in kind of looking at basic sciences, the difficulty in getting it integrated in dental schools, the, the, the difficulty in, in making the transition at, at Columbia, um, what would you do differently if you could, if they'd let you? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me uh, 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 assert that I'm not doing any teaching now and I'm, I'm purely in administration. So I'm not able to do very much of anything to affect the students. Uh, I think an increasingly younger faculty in the clinic, a faculty which has been um, trained in the scientific basis of dentistry, a faculty that has some research experience itself and has some respect for the scientific elements of dentistry and which sees itself not simply as tooth fixers but as people de delivering a medical service to a limited area of the anatomy. To the extent that that's going to happen, this will then be transmitted to the students who will increasingly see themselves as deliverers of a medical service. I haven't said very much about research. That's one of the biggest problems in dentistry, that most dental educators still do not have a solid foundation in research. They don't know how to begin. They don't know what to do. And they therefore don't understand research. If we could fix that, hmm. I think we would change dentistry considerably. And as I I told you earlier, I think that Dr. Lowe, uh, the former director of the National Institutes of, uh, Institute of Dental Research, has made a remarkable contribution to uh, dentistry in establishing the Dentist Scientist Award, 
which creates a, a dentist with a specialty and a dentist with a PhD in a basic science and then says go back to dental school. They can't make them, but they encourage mm. them to go back into the dental schools and become teachers and researchers. I think those kinds of things will help. I, the, the final thing, and I don't know how to do this, is to make the dentist continuously aware that the mouth is a part of the human body mm. and that the things that happen in the mouth are part of a whole constellation of medical, physiological, pharmacological problems that affect the body. Um, looking at dental education, and I, I'm going to ask you now to kind of do a sort of a retrospective across, you know, your long years in, in terms of involvement with dental education. Um, have you seen much change, uh, and, and what kind? I have seen some change. It's been very, very slow, but I, I have to say in fairness that changes in education in general, whether they be arts and sciences, whether they be business education. I just finished mm -hmm. an article in Fortune magazine mm -hmm. on the difficulties of changing traditional business education. Changing anything in education is like moving glaciers <laughs> because there is such intricate, arcane politics in educational institutions. So in order to, to get 10 more hours of, geri no, 10 hours of geriatric dentistry into the curriculum, in a dental school requires that somebody else give something up and they won't do it. Hmm. In order to increase the periodontal training, which we know the general dentist needs, requires a major political upheaval in a dental school, and it's not easy to achieve. What has changed, and I regret it very deeply, is that there's been a, a I think progressive incursion into the hours allotted to the basic sciences and into what the basic sciences can do. And part of this, which also affects medical schools, by the way, part of this is the result of the animal rights movement. Hmm. The things that we were able to show students and have them participate in, we can no longer do because of animal rights. And, and particularly in physiology. Or pharmacology. And pharmacology. Um, again, looking at that progression, um, I know there's been a kind of peaks and valleys in, in the dental applicant pool. And um, are you seeing changes in who's coming to dental school and, and their oh, yes. and their qualities? Oh yes. Well, I, I remind you, I'm not I'm not teaching, so I don't have very much or any real contact or knowledge of the kinds of students who are coming in today. Uh, first of all, as you remember, in uh, 1978, we hit absolutely the, the, the top of the uh, number of applications into dental school. That was the best in history. After 1978, things began to taper off very dramatically. And many, many dental schools, as you know, were threatened. Six of them subsequently closed. Um, in the last two years, there has been I think a significant, a real increase in the number of applicants. Uh, and over the decade, 78 to not, not decade, a decade and a half, there has of course been the dramatic increase in the number of women. Uh, and I think that uh, dental schools are not unmindful that their continued existence is the result of the influx of large numbers of women into dental schools. The curious thing about the current phenomenon in uh, dental school admissions is that while it has gone up significantly, I think 10, 12 percent uh, in the last couple of years, each year, the increase has not been in the number of women applicants, it's been in the number of men applicants, and actually the women are holding steady 
or dropping off slightly. So that's one change we're seeing. First, the big inrush of women, then a steady in, steady number of women applying, and now actually a lower proportion of women to men in the, How in do the you, dental What schools. do you attribute that to? I think that suddenly men have realized that this is a very good career that they have ignored. I, I used to call this the Milken effect. Uh, when all the Wall Street, the Boski, the Milkins, and oh, so on were, were going to mm. jail and business looked so tarnished, a lot of people who had skills uh, but could have gone any place uh, realized this isn't such a nice career after all and I don't want to be a crook. I want to, I want to <laughs> do something decent and help people. I don't understand about the women except that maybe the, the men competitively in the last couple of years have looked better. I did want to say this, however, there's been an immense change in the composition, ethnic and racial, of dental school applicants and acceptees. Uh, I, I can talk for Columbia, but I could talk for almost any school in the country. At Columbia, I think it is now 70% of the incoming class is Asian hmm. or a of Asian descent. And 60% of those Asians are Koreans. We have, we have Russians, we have Iranians, we have, as I say, tons of Asians. Uh, we have m people from the Middle East. It is very, very difficult to find in a, in, in a dental school class, a so-called American-looking student. Hmm. And, and, and your, your sense is this is happening across the country, possibly to different degrees, but... Yeah. In other words, in, uh, in uh, California, I think you're seeing a larger influx of uh, Spanish uh, or Hispanics and of uh, Iranians, a mm -hmm. lot of whom um, mm -hmm. settled in, in uh, Southern California for one reason or another after the uh, revolution there. Uh, in Texas, there is a, a larger mm. number of Hispanics. Okay, follow this through now. In, in, in what way would you anticipate the profession is going to change? Well, ethnically, it's, it's very changed. Yeah, but so in, in terms of, is this going to change how, is this going to change the practice of dentistry? Will uh, and, and the delivery systems. I mean, the, the, the two factors that you pointed out, one was the increased number of women in, in this, the class, and now, more recently, the, the changing ethnic mix. Well, it's a, this is a very uh, a complex and very yes. multifaceted question. Uh, about the women, uh, who now uh, represent, what, about 8 to 10 percent of the popul of the, of mm. the of dentistry in the United States, we're beginning to know a little bit about how they practice. And it is different from the mm. men. They are seen as, uh, and I'm talking now from ADA surveys and uh, other published data on this. I'm not making it up. They spend more time with each patient per visit on the average. They see fewer patients they appear to be, they are described as being more compassionate and more forthcoming with the patients. They spend more time talking with the patients. So there's a little difference in the way they practice, which could change the face of dentistry a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, and I'm quoting from unpublished data, which you will subsequently see soon, uh, they appear to be, in a study, more fearful and more reluctant to treat HIV-positive mm. and AIDS-infected patients. And I'm very curious about that finding because it flies in the face of everything we know, we think we know about women and how compassionate they are and how eager they mm. are to help sick people. So that's the women. I, the uh, next part of my answer to your question is the future of dentistry and how dentistry will change really depends upon the quality of the people that they're taking into dentis dental schools now. 
the, I don't know where I come down on that subject. There are schools I know that are taking substandard students in some number, not 100%. There are some schools whom I believe are trying to hold to very high, previously high standards. But if it is true that the 50% of the class is not as good as it used to be, then I'm not very optimistic that dentistry will undergo s important and valuable changes in the next decade. Hmm. Um, the, now, you, if you're asking me what I think is going to happen in dentistry in general, which is a whole big question. Take a chance. Take a chance. Okay. <laughs> uh, I am not a visionary about dentistry, but that may be because I'm not a dentist. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of new technical things. There's going to be a lot more CAD CAM, there's going to be a lot more cosmetic dentistry, there are going to be lots of nice things that you paint on teeth to, uh, to circumvent dental disease, there will be new tooth color, dental materials that people will find more aesthetically acceptable. I think dentists are, are uh, there's going, there's, there are going to be implants, there's going, there's going to be a lot of cosmetic dentistry, but there's also going to be a lot of just dentistry. Dentists seeing patients in a preventive mode, just as your internist sees you once a year if you believe in that and you go through three hundred dollars worth of tests and a, an interview with him or her and he says everything is just fine this year come back next year and I think the dentist is going to be playing that kind of mm. a role for a lot of people then we have the fact that what 15 18 percent of the American population is going to be aid, aged in a very short time. And no matter how good their teeth have been, I think their teeth will be subject to the same failures as the rest of their body, as carefully mm -hmm. as they may have taken care of it. Their teeth are going to break, and their teeth are going to become discolored, and earlier misadventures with dentists will cycle downward so they'll need crowns and endodontics and everything else. So there'll be the usual kind, I think, the usual kind of business on these millions and billions of teeth that have been saved because of the decline in dental disease among middle class mm -hmm. people. Now, there's a lot of dental disease out there among people who are not middle class. And those people have flowed into this country in unprecedented mm. numbers, and they are going to require care. And so I hope that in the next decade we will solve the problems of the rampant dental disease in the Hispanic population, for instance, that makes up much of the clinic uh, population in Colombia with the baby bottle tooth decay and the dreadful teeth that follow and so on. Mm. still interested in, in some of the issues about how um, medicine and dentistry fit together and, and what happens at the university and I, I want to go back to some real old work of yours back to 1976 when you and Sadowski and Pacozzi were interviewing um, dentists who went to medical school um, and there was a couple of articles that I saw. One was the double degree dilemma that you wrote for the Journal of Oral Surgery and then an another article that appeared in um, the Journal of Medical Education. Um, the, they, were, they were people who were either graduates of dental school who went to medical school or people who were never 
uh, completed dental school who then transferred to medical school that were part of this, the survey that you did. And, um, and it, there was a couple of things that I picked out in here that I thought were kind of interesting and then I'd like to hear some comments that you have now based on now you've had a chance almost 20 years after this to kind of think about it. Um, respondents indicated that a perceived stronger correlation of medicine with the basic sciences and a greater intellectual challenge were among the most important reasons for their career switch from dentistry to medicine. Um, you talked about others who were disillusioned with dental schools. Um, uh, uh, loss of respect for the dental establishment and for dental faculty and disillusion uh, listed as reasons for entering medical school. And I'm sort of wondering, you know, this was a, a sort of a subset of, of, of course, uh, you know, only including those people who actually left dental school. Is what, What's your impression about dental students and, and how they relate to medical school and medical students and reasons for making changes or not changing? Uh, I think there's some proportion of students, dental students, who upon passing that, that barrier, that wall that I used, that illusion that mm -hmm. I made before, uh, the, the basic science years and then you enter into the clinical science years, the, there are a number of students who, uh, who um, go into a state of culture shock almost as they make that transition. Some of them are relieved, obviously, mm. to get there because they really wanted to get directly to the technical stuff. And in many schools today, as you know, the students go directly to patient care as soon as they come into school, so they don't have that abrupt transition. But for a number of students, and I would make no, I would not attempt to estimate the number, uh, who generally are very intellectual or very scientifically inclined, it's a very difficult transition. And some of them at that point experience some question about the, the validity of their career choice. Some of them see themselves as trapped. Yeah. Uh, they've got a vast amount of money invested in dental education, and they can't afford to do anything else but to finish, to get out, to practice, and to make the best of it. The people that I was describing in these articles, and by the way, there were three of them. The third appeared in the Journal of Dental Education, and each one represented a segment of our study. And the study was conducted not through interviews, but through a, uh, um, a I hope, a very carefully designed uh, survey instrument. And I also want to note that it was these papers were done with uh, Donald Sadowski who at that time had just completed his uh, PhD in sociology. So he brought to the um, study not only his experience and insights as a dentist, but as someone who had the latest training mm -hmm. in sociology, which I very much needed. Um, let, me, let, let me, help, help me get back into the... Uh, okay, so now the... Now the question is, we've, we now have some group of students who come to dental school and who say, this isn't really what I wanted. I really wanted to go yep. to medical school. But now we've got the remainder now that, and, and tell me about those. The remainder? Yeah. Uh, I think what happens, or, or let me rephrase your question, okay. uh, some uh, number of frustrated students and frustrated dentists, because I believe in the sample that we did, and I have no idea what the N is for the total number of uh, me medical people in the country who had dental training. Uh, but of the group that we studied, most of them had already completed dental education and were dentists, often with uh, uh, residency training and even practice. Uh, so uh, putting those aside, we have the ones who are somewhat frustrated but for one reason or another cannot afford to uh, retrain themselves or go into another career. What happens to them? That's your question? Mm -hmm. uh, some of them choose the basic, the scientifically oriented dental specialties. Mm -hmm. And I, I would put among these perio, oral surgery, less scientific, but, but it's more medically oriented. And I guess 
a little bit orthodontics. Mm -hmm. Some of them have chosen to, um, in more extreme cases, to pursue uh, graduate degrees in basic sciences. That's a very expensive way to go and also uh, yields you an income. That's not very mm. great when you're finished with it. Uh, in recent years, some of them have chosen the Dentist Scientist Award. And then, and then there are some dentists who are just plain frustrated but are f functioning. Uh, very often very adequately and very successfully. But not to put words in your mouth, but my sense is, is that it, it's your feeling that most of the people who apply to dental school in fact want to be dentists. Absolutely. Yeah. That was a, uh, I, I want to say very emphatically that it was a miracle to us to discover that of the, I think, 246 Mm -hmm. people who completed the study uh, with us, 99% uh, had never applied to medical school. Mm -hmm. Now you can say they were lying. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we trust that mm -hmm. number? But we had embedded in this survey instrument some questions in which inconsistencies in mm -hmm. the accuracy of their response would have come up uh, like, like blinding headlights. For instance, we asked them for the primary reasons why they chose dentistry in the first place. And those reasons were remarkable because they conform to everything that's ever been published about career choice in general and in particular of dentistry. Do you like um, to work with people? Overwhelmingly, yes. Uh, do you like making life and death decisions? No. Uh, do you uh, like working with sick people? Or did you? Did you think mm. you would? You know? mm -hmm. Did you think you liked to work with sick people? Overwhelmingly, no. Mm. That is not a portrait of a, of a, of a doctor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, of a, of a medical man. Mm -hmm. You're a physician. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Um, it, it's a, it, that, that whole issue of, and, I, and it, it's sort of been a thread that's run through some of these other interviews as an aside, was, was really looking at the, the, the whole issue of how do you, the, the tension between keeping the dentistry separate from medicine and merging them, and, and I think this is really valuable information towards that end. Um, let's, let's come back to you now. and. Um, um, you decided to leave NYU and take a position with the American Dental Association. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Ginley, who was then the director, uh, he wasn't the director, uh, it was John Cody who was mm -hmm. the director, and uh, Tom Ginley, who was the associate director, really um, wooed me. I was really recruited for that job. I had no intention of leaving uh, NYU, although I had obviously all the dissatisfactions that anybody has had mm. in, uh, in a long-held long job. Uh, and, and certainly the idea of um, uh, moving myself to Chicago was not one that was uh, instantly appealing. Uh, so I, but, but they did recruit me and I agreed to go for two years, uh, which very few people knew. Uh, obviously I wasn't going to tell my staff that I'm going to be here for two years. But I did tell my dean at NYU that I would like a leave of absence for two years so I could pursue this job, and then I would be back. And we scheduled my whole uh, course load around this, uh, mm -hmm. this promise. At the end of, um, I don't know, six weeks <laughs> or some mm -hmm. very brief time, I realized that it was a very interesting job. And as the months rolled on, I had an increasingly difficult time imagining going back to NYU, so. Now, now your responsibilities there were for research? And I, no, not no. exclusively. Uh, we had a research facility both in the Chicago building, mm -hmm. which I think very few people realize that there mm -hmm. was research going on at 211 Chicago Avenue in the heart of Chicago and next mm -hmm. door to Neiman Marcus. And uh, we also had laboratories uh, housed as guests 
in the then National Bureau of Standards, now National mm -hmm. Institute of Standards and Technology. And all of that came under my purview. But what I, I was in charge of a division of scientific affairs. And that touched on anything that had any relevance to science. Hmm. So when the mercury controversy broke, that was our problem. Hmm. When the case of the dentist in Florida who infected now six patients, that was our problem. When suits arose against dentists who would not treat HIV positive patients, we were called upon to respond uh, when the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration was writing its hate hated standard. I was the one who went and presented the, tr the, the testimony on behalf of the association. So it was a very, very diverse, very multifaceted, fascinating job. Now, how much of, of those issues was Cody Ginley aware of when they were recruiting him for the job, and, and what were they hoping to accomplish? Um, <clears throat> I think they were aware of nothing, of <laughs> none of these issues. The major issue when I got that job were uh, the SEAL programs. That was the, there was a little, there was a little bit of science going on, as I said, and then there were um, these programs uh, in which uh, seals of approval were affixed mm -hmm. to either consumer products or professional products. So when you pick up a tube of toothpaste mm -hmm. in the drugstore, mm -hmm. uh, some people apparently look to see whether the ADA has approved this product. And I had um, that as part of my responsibilities as well. I can tell you that it was the least favorite part of my job mm. because I didn't really know what the SEALs did for the American public or for the profession. Uh, I probably am wrong about that because I understand that consumer decisions are driven to an extent by the presence of that SEAL on a, mm. on a uh, Mm -hmm. product that they use for oral health. When you think about those years, you were there a total of, what, seven years, I think? Eight. Eight. Um, what do you think you learned? <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned about politics uh, and the politics of dentistry, which is a microcosm of politics in the United States, or I guess any place. Talk a little bit about that. Um, if you want. Sure. Uh, but I think you'll have to ask the questions. Well, okay. Um, well, well, why don't you finish? So, when did you learn about the politics? I learned about politics. I, um, I learned a lot about dentistry and the concerns of dentistry. And I'm not unsympathetic to them. Uh, I mean, how could I be? Because I've Mm -hmm. I've had my whole living, practically, from dentistry. I learned a lot about dentists, and I learned to respect them a lot for their integrity, the ones that I dealt with, for their dignity, for their position in the community. I also learned, and this is was very interesting to me, that dentistry is very different in different parts of the country. The esteem in which the dentist is held in the Middle West, for instance, is very different from the esteem in which the dentist is held in New York City. In, in what way different? I think that the dentist in Rapid City, South Dakota, is one of the most esteemed uh, respected citizens in the community. Hmm. Uh, he stands shoulder to shoulder with the banker, with the minister, with the, uh, the physician, hmm. with the director of the hospital. Uh, in New York, uh, there's a, a feeling, uh, and I think it's held by the dentists themselves, 
I'm not as good as, I'm not as important as, people don't respect me as much. Mm -hmm. Come back to the, now, now we'll come back to the politics. Um, the, you, you came away and you said, I, I learned that the, about dental politics and that it's a microcosm of politics nationally. And in, in, in what way do you mean that? The, the um, Dental Association is a complex political organization mm -hmm. that is run by a board of trustees, each one elected from uh, a region of the United States in which there are a certain number of members of the association. They achieve their trusteeship through a lifetime of service to organized dentistry, working their way slowly and laboriously through the, the component dental society uh, in some small town or maybe in, in a, a place on Long Island and then moving on to become prominent at the state level and then running for trustee. The day they run, for, the day they are elected trustee, they become anxious to become president of the ADA. That's, mm. that. so everything is carefully arranged so that they go through that ever narrowing pyramid mm. so they'll come out on the top. This means that if you're running for president of anything, uh, you've got to be very, very careful with your mm -hmm. constituents and you've got to be very sensitive to what your constituents want. And there was no more sensitive issue, well, I shouldn't say that, but there, there, there were sensitive issues in the ADA that principally centered on scientific affairs and the AIDS issue. Mm -hmm and infection control issues and federal regulations and the right to advertise and so on. And the trustees were dancing around, had to dance around the need to satisfy just as every senator and every representative has to do to satisfy their constituents. Well, let's, let's take that, and, and I, I want to deal with something that I know you've written about and talked about, which was policy making in the eye of a storm, is, is the words you used. Oh, yeah. um, and how does that play out when, and I have the feeling you were probably talking about the, the dentist in Florida. Yes. Um, how does, tell me how that played out in, in terms of how the policy finally got made and, 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 and how you were feeling through all of that. Well, I think it's important to discuss it in, 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 with, with the background firmly in hand. Uh, we learned in June uh, of 1990, I was the one who was contacted by the Centers for Disease Control, that they had discovered that a dentist, and they wouldn't say where, had infected a patient and they wouldn't say who or what the sex was. And I said, that's impossible. It's, I, I couldn't believe it. We were mm. absolutely stunned. But I went right to the director, uh, to Dr. Ginley and to the other directors at my level. And we called an emergency meeting and we said, how are we going to handle this? Because this is a public relations disaster for dentistry. And uh, we, we, we managed somehow to surmount this and we set out uh, press releases and, and all kinds of things. Um, shortly thereafter, the real nightmare occurred. The, the one, one case was a phenomenon. You really mm -hmm. didn't have to worry about it. You just said this is never going to happen again and let's mm -hmm. forget about it. Very soon thereafter, the second case arose. And at that point, uh, everything disintegrated and the board realized that they had to react responsibly to panic. Mm. So they uh, got together and they wrote 
some kind of policy. Now, I should say in fairness that the Board of Trustees had um, developed policy about treatment of HIV-positive patients before the case in Florida. And, and that was a little bit under my pressure and under Dr. Ginley's pressure because we thought it was necessary to say to the world that the Dental Association believes these people have to mm. be treated. So the, the Council on Ethics and the board both developed a, a, a code of ethics and a, a policy statement that said, you shall treat, uh, which is not um, legally binding in any way. Uh, the question then arose, the, the question that the, the association had to confront was, what do we say about the infected healthcare professional? Here's a man in Florida who was allowed to practice mm. uh, almost at the time he died, and, and nobody knew, and, he, and two people were going to die. And the, the implications of this were unspeakable were unacceptable to the board. And that's why I say they have, I think, a, a great inner sense of, of integrity and responsibility to the patient. And they were struggling horribly with that. And they were struggling horribly with the fact that they're an association of dentists and that they owed their own hmm. people some, uh, some protection from uh, instant death if hmm. they uh, were revealed to be HIV positive. So um, they developed a policy statement that basically said that if a healthcare professional uh, was known to be HIV positive, he should uh, um, be seen, uh, the decision as to whether to continue to practice would be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. And then, as you know, the history, more and more history, the third patient, the fourth patient, the fifth patient became infected, and then there was real uh, panic. And CDC stepped in and said, this is what you should do. If, if, the, if the healthcare provider is infected, he should uh, stop practice uh, and or, or inform his or her patients. And we said, that's ridiculous, because if you do that, you might as well walk out the door, mm. close the door, and never go back to your office because no mm. patients are going to come to you. Um, the CDC uh, developed a, um, a marvelous thing they called exposure prone procedures. And they said uh, anybody who does an exposure prone procedure uh, should and has, the, has AIDS or HIV infection uh, should reveal his status to the patient. And you, medical associations, dental associations, are going to tell us what an exposure-prone procedure is. And our board, out of political panic, said, OK, OK, we'll tell you what an exposure-prone procedure is. And they labored over that, and I was on that committee. But all the other medical uh, associations said, we won't do it. Mm. The, the medical association did, but the pediatric people said no, the neurologists said no, the physical medicine people said no, and we were really hanging out there alone. And so you ask how it worked out politically. The dental association brought a set of resolutions to its annual House of Delegates and said, here, we want you to vote on this, and it basically said, if you are an HIV-infected dentist and you want to continue to do exposure-prone procedures, which are these and these and these and these, you must report yourself to your patients as being infected. And we were killed hmm. in the House of Delegates. And we were killed by two extremely articulate, persistent people, one from New York, one from Rhode Island, who said, this is absurd. You've got an absurd policy here. We don't." Look at the five people who were infected. None of them had an exposure-prone procedure by your definition. So what are you doing to your members? At any rate, in the end, we came down with a policy that said uh, that this should be decided 
uh, by an expert panel on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm. There was um, there was a, there was an interesting interesting story. Um, I just want to just read from something that was that you wrote about at that time, if I could find it. Um, and it was, in fact, something that I was going to ask you if you could elaborate on. Um, you're talking about the, the changes. This was in an article in the uh, ADA Journal in 1991. Um, you talk about significant changes in policies relating to HIV infection. Um, these changes have been neither random nor, no, nor capricious. And then you go on to say, rather they reflect a growing awareness of the complexity of the disease, evolving moral and ethical concerns, and fear that should have that should have but has not yielded to increasing familiarity with the disease and i'm just wondering what you were meaning by that that as people became more familiar with the disease that wasn't reflected in the changing policy i think this was written before the policy um, of the ada the proposed policy was defeated by the House and oh, rewritten. I see. Uh, because I alone, I, I have to say alone, uh, among the principal directors of the ADA felt that it was not sensible, not ethically correct, not scientifically wise to say to HIV positive medical or dental people, you may not practice unless you reveal your status. Mm. Because there was no scientific basis to indicate that they posed a significant mm. risk to their patients. And I felt that if we had come to grips better with the scientific realities of the disease, we wouldn't have written that mm. policy. I think I would probably not say that today because mm. I couldn't. Well, yeah, interesting. Um, one of the things that, um, that um, also in, in reviewing some of the literature was a survey that was done of women dentists uh, that you participated in with a whole bunch of other folks. Um, and it was, it was again published in the ADA Journal in December of 91. Um, one of the things that it also did was... Um, Is this it, a Kent Nash? Uh, oh, no, this was written by you and about, oh, I guess six or seven women who did oh, a survey yes, of yes. women dentists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in there was, was also some quotes about, um, um, about people in, women in, in professional fields, and I, I just want to quote what... Um, what was said by you. <laughs> I, are you sure? I, am, I, am I quoted uh, saying the, that? Well, it, here it comes. Uh, you okay. could, <laughs> um, coming from the world of academia to the everyday challenge of helping dentists deal with, quote, hot issues facing the profession, Enid Neidl, PhD, says there is an apparent difference of how women are treated in dentistry versus education. Um, and now this is the quote. Um, as a teacher, I was keenly aware of how women were treated differently in academia, Dr. Neidl says, yet at the ADA, I have seen no difference in the challenges that face women than those that face men. And I was wondering if you might reflect a little bit on what some of those challenges might have been in academia or the differences that you found. Oh, well, you did dig, uh, dig up a, a, <laughs> a, cha a challenging quote. Um, I think it's fair to say that I um, experienced and witnessed some very serious discrimination against women in academia. And uh, I, it, apart from being subjective and foolish about that, there's been a lot of very serious published material on how women are treated in academia, about how they, uh, how difficult it is for them to um, uh, reach the, the uh, rank of professor, how they have been systematically underpaid in academia, uh, on how they um, are hired uh, in great numbers, particularly in the biological sciences, where they represent a fair number of the PhDs each year, uh, how they're hired at the, for the low-level jobs and then dropped 
abruptly mm -hmm. when they become eligible for tenure. It was a, um, when I started in academia, it was a truly poisoned atmosphere for women. Uh, I think that women scientists today would say it is still bad. And I think women in the arts and sciences, that is the liberal arts uh, parts of universities, would say exactly the same thing. It's changing slowly, but not nearly fast enough when you consider the numbers. Now, I think that quotation really referred to the fact that the ADA, as an employer, had gotten its act together and was behaving very well indeed to women. When you track your career, um, and, and clearly it's been a, a whole series of milestones of accomplishments, uh, you know, moving through the ranks, professor, chairman, uh, you know, senior ADA position, and senior position now at Columbia, it doesn't appear to be reflected in your progression. No, but that's, that's a statistic. Uh, what you have to look at is the universe of, okay. of women who, well, who've done this kind of thing. And I... Um, well, how, do, how do you account for the... F um, luck. You think it was luck? <laughs> so. <laughs> Maybe talent? Uh, a, 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 a persistence, uh, uh, obtuseness, um, a willingness to suffer a little bit or a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you a, a crazy story. When I was uh, at NYU, I was, of course, the only woman in the department. Uh, I was the only, uh, eventually, the only professor in the school who was a woman. Uh, for two years, we, we ate in a, in a lunchroom that had been sort of set aside um, together, the men and I, the men telling raunchy stories all the time, trying to drive me out, and I tried not to listen. And then one day they just closed the door and I wasn't allowed in at all. Mm. Mm. Now, what do you do about that? You, you stay in your own office and you eat alone or you figure out some other place mm. to eat. Uh, do you reproach anyone? No. Do you say anything? No. Mm. And then after two years, they opened the door. Mm. Now, I think there are uh, women, um, both historically and today, who, because they are more empowered and, and, and less isolated, who would have made a big fuss. Mm. Uh, there, there, it was discovered in 1976 by the new president of the university, uh, Dr. Sawhill, um, and by me because of some other coincidence, that all the women in the mm. university had been paid seriously less than the men at the same level of achievement, same rank, same background, same productivity. Um, Sawhill changed that overnight. Hmm. But if you stop and think about it, if you've been underpaid for 20 years, what does that do to your pension? Hmm. What did that do to your standard of living? You can make it right this year, mm -hmm. but you can't make it right for the rest of your yeah. life. Of course, you can make it right for the people that follow. That's right. Yeah. And a lot of people talked about class actions, suits, and many of the women said, I, wo I won't do that because they will destroy me mm. by saying that I'm neurotic, that I'm a troublemaker, mm. and so on and so forth. Mm. So that's, I think, what that mm. quotation, I, I was breathing a <laughs> sigh of relief <laughs> at, at what the, I discovered at the at ADA, the, which I didn't really anticipate you know. because the ADA doesn't, doesn't suggest itself as a bastion of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, liberality and, and uh, Altruism. Well, um, um, just to kind of complete that thought, I'll, 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 of course, I have the advantage in having <laughs> read <laughs> through all of your stuff. And I uh, haven't looked at it for years. <laughs> yeah. so. um, but you do go on to say, I mean, this is advice. She encourages women, this is still talking about you, um, uh, in the field to become active in organized dentistry in order to fulfill career aspirations. And then another quote says, get involved at the local level and get your fair share of leadership roles, she says. They are open to you, and by participating, you can help shape the future of the profession. And I think that sort of captures what, in fact, you've done. Well, I, this, uh, now, now I begin to get the context of this. 
this really had to do with women uh, in organized dentistry. And women, uh, w when I first came, I heard a lot from women about how the powerful positions were not open to them. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and of course, at that time, Jerry Morrow, who became the president of the ADA, the first woman president, was on her way up and clearly on her way to becoming president. But I was a little impatient with the women who were complaining because what they were really saying, and also the young people, young men. I'm very smart. I, I want to be in organized dentistry. I want to achieve power in, in, the, in the hierarchy. So here I am, use me. And I thought to myself, but you've got to work for this. You've mm -hmm. got to join. You've got to go yeah. to the darn meetings yeah. night after night and week after week and be bored with everybody else. And then you will achieve something of what you're looking for. And I have seen a lot of women trying that and being very successful. Mm. Um, talking about your success, I, 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 I do have to ask you a couple of things. Um, as I went through your, your CV, the things that I thought um, I didn't know. Um, tell me about the Harvey Society. The Harvey Society was a very, is a very uh, small uh, group of mainly, um, um, I will, I'll say, medical scientists and um, research-oriented physicians. And it's named after William Harvey, and mm -hmm. you are elected to it. And they held meetings about, um, oh, once a month in New York City. And the uh, lecturer was usually a very eminent scientist. Mm -hmm. And then each year, a small, thin volume of uh, the lectures was published. And it uh, was, you were, as I say, elected. Well, I, I do also want to mention for the, um, for the viewers that um, you also received, uh, among your awards is the one that says um, American Men of Science. So <laughs> <laughs> something. <laughs> and, um, and the Great Teacher Award of, um, of yeah. the New York University Alumni Federation. So uh, just, to, just to get the record. Um, the, the, the CV, of course, lists the, the, um, the accomplishments and the awards. What, when you think of your career to this point, what, what stands out to you as the thing that you feel most proud of? Uh, um, I think I have been very gratified by the fact that in my years at the ADA, when they sort of wound me up and sent me around the country to lecture, to, to do all kinds of presentations. Actually, the ADA didn't per se do that, but, but so, dental societies and groups invited me, and of course the ADA encouraged that, that I went nowhere where I did not encounter a student or a group of students who had traveled a distance to hear me. Mm. And that, I think, moved me the most and made me feel as, I, as if I had not wasted my life and that I had left an impress on a number of students who still respected me enough to want to come and hear me. Oh. Any regrets? Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 that you want anybody to know about. <laughs> I think I was foolish in, in um, assuming that um, it was my duty to follow my husband rather mm -hmm. than have him follow me mm -hmm. because the medical uh, job was a very good one mm -hmm. and probably would have led to a very different career. Mm -hmm. and. Curiously, the man who hired me for that job was one of the was an was an elderly, distinguished uh, pharmacologist physician, and he was deeply conservative politically. Mm. He came from Kansas. He had never smoked or drank in his life, and he was the one who wanted to be the first department chairman at Jefferson to have a woman. Mm. And he wanted to build my career. Mm. Mm. Interesting. 
and I and I feel that I failed him oh. uh, in in making a decision that reflected all the um, the oh the foolishness that uh, women carried around about mm -hmm. what they could do and what they couldn't yeah. do and what they owed their family and so on. Yeah. But in the context of the time. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and what happens now? I mean, what, what, um, what other achievements are, are, are ahead? Oh, I don't know that. <laughs> I, I, in many ways, would like to try to do something different. But I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I think going back to Colombia uh, is, a, in, in a way, a cop out. It's, mm. it's something I do easily, and it's mm. not requiring a great shift in, in my, in, uh, my in, in what I do and what I know and, and in my training. And I did want to get into um, adult illiteracy. Mm. But it's very difficult. One learns this when one is in pseudo retirement. One learns that it's very, very difficult to break into skilled volunteer work mm. because there are just as in any other career, there are people who've started at the very bottom and they have learned these skills and they don't want strangers and interlopers to come in and expect to be the top dog or even an important one. Sounds a lot like your quote like something about getting involved at the local level yeah, and, and work right. your way up. It's, it's late. It's late to do that. Well, well, we'll get you in front of the cameras again and we'll find out what happened. Okay. If I Thank live you. that long. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. And I <clears throat> repeat that I'm <clears throat> very honored to have been uh, chosen to be in the company of some very distinguished uh, dental educators and dentists. Yeah. And we're delighted to have you. <laughs>